All right, if you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and open it to the book of Acts, where Terrell just read from us, for us. Uh, if you're unsure where that is, it's about maybe 80% of the way through the Bible. Uh, we've been going Genesis through Revelation, as you know, if you've been with us for a little while. And last week, we hit a pretty pivotal turning point, right? Jesus has died, he is resurrected, he ascended into heaven, and he sent the Holy Spirit in his place. And as the Holy Spirit came, uh, what happened is a massive crowd drew around, and Peter uh, really steps up to the plate and with boldness declares the gospel, right? And people who are hearing are cut to the heart, and they respond with repentance, and their sins are forgiven, and they follow through, by the way, with baptism, which in that day, by the way, is, is a pretty big act. Uh, things were still pretty dicey in Jerusalem, and so when you kind of put your public yes on the table for Jesus, that puts a target on your back. And yet, that day, 3,000 people said yes to Jesus. That's incredible, right? Like, I don't know how your stocks are doing or how your MLM growth curve is looking, but a 26x multiple in one day is pretty astounding. That's what happens, and that's how God staggeringly launches this new thing called the church. Jesus goes, the Holy Spirit comes. The gospel goes, and salvation comes. The Spirit has lit the flame, and the church of Christ is born. So what is the church, though, right? Have you ever thought about that question? Uh, It's actually a really hard uh, question to answer. Um, What if I had asked you today to paint a picture of the church, (laughs) right? Um, Some of you I can see are already hyperventilating because I just said the word paint, right? You're freaking out in your seat. Well, don't worry, we're not doing that because me too. I would not be up for that. Now, I grew up around an art, artsy family. My grandma was an art instructor, okay? She taught people how to paint, and so art kind of permeated our family. My sister grew up very artistic, painting, scrapbooking. She was into projects. Usually, I was the project, <laughs> right? The canvas was my face. And, and so, uh, as I married Lauren, though, I, I just more into the arts world. Fine arts major, super creative, loves to paint, loves to draw, calligraphy, all the fancy pretty stuff, right? You know, scripture, you know, drawing. I don't know what you guys do with scripture and your journals and stuff like that. It's really pretty. But she does those things, right? And so, I remember one of even our first dates is uh, we, we painted together. Now, it wasn't one of those things where you show up and there's like coaching and there's like wine, right? And you're sipping things and you're getting some help and, you know, it's this fun experience. No, no, no. It was just free for all, like show up, blank canvas, have fun, right? So like I'm, I'm over there just worrying about if my, if the hair on my stick figure is actually going to make it out to be a guy or not, right? (laughs) Can we tell who this is? Meanwhile, she's just creating these beautiful, whimsical pictures and having the time of her life. I'm reflecting on how I ever passed kindergarten. (laughs) Then we had two girls, and Hobby Hobby Lobby exploded in our home, right? We have art everywhere. They both love to draw, they love to paint, they love to glue, they love glitter and sequins and beads and jewelry and all the kinds of stuff that hurt your feet when you walk on it in the middle of the night. And that's our home. It's great. It's great. It's just not my territory, okay? Dad's territory, I'm into tickle fights, I'm into making forts, and I will build a high-speed slip and slide with a ramp on the end or something like that. That's what I do, okay? But when it comes to art, hey, wait for mom to get home, okay? Now, all of that to say, what would you paint? Right? That was my long way of saying, what would you paint? If you were asked, what is the church? Paint a picture of the church. Maybe you would immediately think of a building. Uh, maybe you would go to a church service like this. Um, maybe you would start thinking in the form of like traditions or denominations or like leadership structures. Maybe it's way more organic than that. And you're thinking music and you're thinking experiences and you're thinking friendships and people holding hands, right? Maybe, maybe you're thinking stained glass windows, 
student ties, lock-ins, like, remember those? I don't know what you're thinking, but you're probably not thinking of farm, by the way, right? No one's probably painting a farm, which is pretty awesome that we have this. But whatever it is, mark this, what you think of and how you define and describe what the church is, is incredibly important. It's incredibly important. What if I changed the question and I asked, what should the church be? Then what would you draw? In Acts 2 through 6, we see God's painting of the church. And it's not an art gallery, it's real. It's on the canvas of human lives, fleshed out for us to see clearly what they were like, what they cared about, what they did, what they committed themselves to. And as we see his brushstrokes through these verses today, I want you and I to evaluate, is this me? Am I doing this? Are we at the well embodying this? Okay, it's a chance for us to examine where we're at and for the Lord to encourage us and grow us. So here we go, Acts 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Four things in this snapshot verse the church devoted themselves to. Well, first, the apostles' teaching. What were the apostles teaching? Well, they were teaching what Jesus taught them. They would have started with the Old Testament, right? But with a fresh um, understanding of Jesus fulfilling everything that the scriptures had been pointing to. So they taught the Old Testament, but then they also taught what Jesus taught, what he actually said, and what he did. They carried it on. In fact, John 14 says that the Holy Spirit would come and bring to mind everything that Jesus taught and said for the apostles. So they taught the Old Testament. They taught what Jesus taught and did, but they also taught the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection. We call this the gospel. We begin to show how these scriptures apply to daily life, part one, part two, and part three of the story that we've been going through. That's what they taught, and the people were devoted to it. They would study it. They would pour over it. They would meditate on it. They would discuss it and chop it up together and ultimately obey it. You see, we have at the foundation of this early church a word-centered leadership and discipleship. People cared about the truth. They wanted to know God through his word, and that was the central foundation of this church, a sharing of belief. Now, the sharing of belief leads to number two, a sharing of life, fellowship. And I'm sorry to disappoint you this morning. This word does not mean potlucks with spike ball and inflatables for the kids. I'm all about spike ball, but that's not what this word means, right? I don't know what your, what your connotation of that. I think oftentimes Christians use this word as like synonymous with fun. Like because we're Christians, we can't say we party. We just say we fellowship, right? It's like this weird Christianese way of saying that we do things that are clean and fun. No, that's not fellowship. Fellowship is an amazing word, one of the most amazing words in the human language. In the Greek, koinonia. Koinonia, the word koine, common. We have all things in common. There's a communion, a union together between us. And on one hand, it's a relational word. It means our lives are infusing together. We're sharing life. Like, I know your struggles at work. I know your deepest fears. I know how you like your tacos. We laugh so hard that it makes us hurt. We confide in one another about weaknesses and struggles and sin. We confess things to each other. We, we run to each other when there's a crisis in our life. We share life, koinonia. It's a oneness, which is really important to see, right? That the gospel is not just a theological truth to be molded over in our brains, but it's something to flesh out on the pages of everyday life together. Quinonia is a deep Christ-centered relationship where I'm dedicated to serving you and knowing you. But it's not just sharing life, it's sharing purpose. This is a missional word. So on one hand, Quinonia is family, but on the other hand, it's a family with a mission. It's a team. We have a common goal, a common objective. 
And so the result is this incredible deep camaraderie, right? Kind of like what soldiers form on the front lines in the trenches of war. It brings them together in a, a kind of deep, unexplainable bond. We have a common shared belief, but we also have a common shared goal. And in the middle of that is koinonia, gospel community. Look at Philippians 2 with me. <clears throat> Philippians 2.2, 2, Paul refers to this as being one in spirit and in purpose. What a phrase. One in spirit and intent on the same purpose. That's koinonia. And where it comes from, actually, verse 1, there's a koinonia. Do you see this? A participation or a fellowship with what? The Holy Spirit. So our koinonia with the Lord creates a koinonia together. We're devoted to the truth of Jesus, and it creates a oneness that's centered around him. Now, number three, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Okay, here's the food part. (laughs) All right. Except this isn't just any old sharing of meals. We're going to get there. That's one thing they do. But this is the breaking of bread. This is the Lord's Supper. In Acts 20, verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. See, this is a specific set out weekly meeting where we're gathering to intentionally reflect on Christ's death for our sin. It's what we're doing today. The breaking of bread. And we will do that in a minute. And this is important because it's showing that the church is not a nilly-willy, do-your-own-thing. It wasn't splintered house churches kind of all going their own direction. There's some central organization to this. And there's a set-out, intentional time to remember the gospel all together as we reflect on the fact that We were once a wretch, right? And the amazing grace of Jesus intercepted our lives. So yes, we're doing life organically together, but we're also doing it officially, gathering together. Number four, and lastly, they devoted themselves to prayer. This is a vital activity throughout the book of Acts. You're going to see, everywhere we look, we're going to see the church praying. Sometimes it's carved out time. Sometimes it's week-long prayer meetings. Sometimes they're going to the temple together to pray at a certain hour. Sometimes it's in response to difficult things. In spontaneity, they cry out to God for help and power and healing and direction and wisdom. Prayer is their spiritual breath. They're breathing in and out this direct relationship with God. God. And by the way, this is critical because what it's declaring is that the church is not driven by programs or production. It's driven by prayer. That's the spiritual engine of this young group of believers. And by the way, it's what people are thirst, what they're thirsting for. Nobody's thirsting for an organization, (laughs) right? People want what? Direct connection to God. So these are the four things they pursued. Now, look at the rest of the passage. It's the four things they displayed. The four things they pursued were like their roots, and now what we're going to see are the fruits born out of that root. Look at verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. The first fruit is a reverence, a worship, a deep Amazement and joy in God. Awe is the thing that if you ever stood at the base of the Himalayas, you would feel as you looked up and stared at the majesty. Or, or some of you have looked over the outer rim of the Grand Canyon and the vastness in your panoramic view, right? It's what you feel when you are mesmerized by the crashing of ra- waves on the sea coast and the powerful spray that's ignited. When you are caught up in something that looks outside of yourself to something that's greater than you, you feel a, a glimpse of what we feel right now, or what we, what we see right there. That's the awe we're talking about. Now, take that and multiply it, because we're not feeling awe towards creation, we're feeling it towards creator. In other words, this group of believers was captivated by the glory of God. They were captivated by the glory of God. They had seen his mercy and his kindness and his power and his faithfulness and his justice and his compassion. And they were blown away. They they had seen the worth of Jesus. That's what this is, worship. The worth of Jesus had collided in their soul and there was awe 
as they humbly put Jesus in his proper place in their hearts. See, this is critical because Christianity is not a transaction merely, right? It's not you walking down an aisle checking a box. It is a treasuring in our hearts, and awe came upon every soul. Now, look at the second part of the verse. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So number two, the second fruit is power. The Holy Spirit is coming on the backside of this truth, and he's confirming it with miracles, supernatural signs and wonders. We saw it last week, right, with uh, Pentecost, the languages. But it doesn't stop there. That wasn't a one-time deal. The next chapter, chapter 3, they meet a 40-year-old man who's been paralyzed from birth. And through the name of Jesus, Peter heals this dude. He stands up, and he goes from lame to leaping in an instant. Right? Uh, A couple chapters later, we see the disciples imprisoned. And guess who steps in to supernaturally break them out? God sends angels, right? In chapter 4, we see that many people were coming with their sicknesses and infirmities and afflictions. And the, the apostles were driving out demons. People were getting healed. The Spirit is showing up in supernatural ways. That's the power this church had. Number three, not just awe, not just power. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Koine. And they were selling their possessions and belongings. They were distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their own homes. There was sacrificial love in this early church. They had all things in common. Like, what do you mean they had all things in common? Like, they rooted for the same team? They were the same Enneagram type? Right? They shopped at the same stores? No. Right? No. They had all of their possessions in common. No one said, this is mine. They did what? The exact opposite. They were radically generous, giving up what they had in order to give to someone who didn't have This is an astonishing kind of community. We read even in chapter 4 about um, people selling their fields and laying it down at the apostles' feet, saying, hey, do whatever you want with it. I trust you to give to whoever has need. Some of you in the church have done the same thing. Hey, here's a car. Here's, I I have an open job for someone. Here's some gift cards. Here's a, a computer to bless a family. Whatever you need, just give this away to whoever has need. That's the type of radical generosity this early church had. And listen, it's not socialism. Some people are like, oh, see, there's a socialism picture here in the Bible. No, this was not demanded. It was not imposed. This was a free, willing gift that people were giving out of their own desire and joy. There's no obligation. And the government wasn't controlling it. They were entrusting it to the leaders of the church. There wasn't only, though, a generosity under the sacrificial love. There was also a hospitality. Did you see it? They're opening up their homes. (laughs) They're inviting people in. See, life, as you know, is a war. And this early church is embodying this just radical warmth where we invite people in and use our homes to serve people in the front lines suffering of this world. I want to meet your needs. I want to meet you with kindness. I want you to feel accepted and loved where you are at. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield, I love this uh, in her book, um, talks about, you know, the gospel comes with a house key. In fact, one of the, the best ways to recognize that the gospel's landed in someone's house is when they open up their home. So a demonstration that what Jesus has done has actually taken root. So you see this picture of this church? They're doing, and we call it doing life together, right? They really are actually doing life together, not merely when I have time. It's not just an event. It's not an open tab on many windows of my computer. It, it's interlaced into everything. This is a community. Acts chapter 4 is going to describe them as being one in heart and soul. <laughs> wow. 
Now, they didn't create this unity. Jesus created this unity. But they are tenaciously guarding it and cultivating it. You see that? Okay, number four, the fourth root. They received with glad and generous hearts their food. They were praising God together. This is a thankful and happy community. Like nothing about this gathering and these people doing these things is rigid, mechanical, religious, empty ritual. No, this is the opposite. It is vibrant. It is exciting. It's life-giving. They are embodying this kind of unfazed happiness that you and I long for. And I I think it's so interesting, right? The lie to you and I is that in order to find happiness, we have to hold on to our stuff. We have to pursue our own dreams at all costs. Kind of an individualistic pursuit of freedom and possessions. And yet here, it's the opposite is happening. They're radically giving things away to meet others' needs. And the backside is what? Total joy. (laughs) They're flourishing. Now look at the end of the passage. Look at what God does as a result. They praised God and they had favor with all the people, verse 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This kind of lifestyle was attractive. And people were being brought in because healthy things grow. And the message of Jesus kept going out, cutting people to the heart, and inviting them into the same grace of God. They were witnesses. This is what Acts 1 said last week, right? Would happen. And this growth of the church was not a byproduct unintentionally, it was a byproduct intentionally. These Men and women were ferociously bold with the gospel. They weren't huddling little hermits in their homes, right, as they were doing this in a a little commune together. No, they were living out in the city. They were going to the temple. They kept pursuing their jobs and their careers and their neighbors and mixing it up. And the result was, right, this powerful testimony of a community doing life around Jesus this way went out. And others came in Look at Acts 4.20, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Look at what Peter and John say as they're held before the rulers and told, stop talking about Jesus. Here's what they say. We can't help speaking about what we have seen and heard. But you can't stop me from talking about this. It's too good. You cannot shut me up. I have to talk about it. Evangelism for the early church was not an obligation or a duty. It's not like, hey, sign up on Sunday at 6 o'clock, we're going to do this. Right? It's a natural outflow of their own life. Because, listen, when you experience personally the goodness of Jesus, you can't help but publicly share the goodness of Jesus. That's what happens. We talk about the things that we treasure That's just an inevitable truth in your life. You do talk about the things that you treasure. And what we see, here's our summary picture. Here's the painting God's made for us in this passage. This early church was rallying around three things. We might say, number one, they were worshipers. Captivated by the goodness and the glory of God and saving them as sinners, and now they were pursuing him ferociously in his word and prayer. There was a shared belief, but there was also a shared life. They weren't just worshipers, right? They were family. They were committed to sacrificially loving each other, and they were fighting for unity through humility as they gave generously, and they walked hospitably in total commitment to the community. Y'all, I don't know how to say this. Christianity is not an individual sport. (laughs) You can't show up on Sundays and then the rest of the week be in private following Jesus. It doesn't work like that because he's, yes, saved you from your sin and to himself, but he's also saved you into his family. Worshippers' family, number three, were witnesses compelled by the gospel that go and boldly share with others what they personally have experienced themselves, right? Shared belief, shared life, 
shared mission. That is the church. It is what we see in these five chapters. And it's kind of like a fire, okay? I want you to have this picture of analogy of a fire. Um, the warmth of the flame is, is kind of the fire of our red-hot worship for Jesus. As we gaze into the flames, it's warming our souls. That's that awe, that's that worship, right? That's devoting ourselves to the apostles, teaching the truth of who Jesus is, the fire. Now, as you do that, as we're faced on the fire, others are coming around and also staring and gazing at the flames and getting warm. And so we find ourselves, what, side by side, together looking at the fire, being warmed. And then that heat and that light is what? Attracting others and drawing people in. And we grab with a hand those who are cold and outside and pull them in to the community. I say, look, be warmed. That is this three kind of pronged picture here of the church. Wow, what a picture, right? Like, I hope this is stirring your heart to see this picture here. And, and I also hope it's jogging your memory because what we're talking about is kind of familiar if we go all the way back to what? The garden. Don't we see this kind of community? As God creates humanity to become one. And we saw the people of God living in the presence of God, fulfilling the purpose of of God. That's the Garden of Eden. And they're doing it with a radical type of unity. They were naked and they were unashamed, Adam and Eve were. There was trust, there was vulnerability. I'm here for you to serve you. And no, I'm here for you to serve you. And so everyone's needs are met as they enjoy God together. That's Eden. Now we know the rest of the story, right? We walked through it all fall. It's a broken mess from Genesis 3 on. And that community is fractured in an instant. And so in steps Jesus. And now he has recreated a new community. A community, check this, that's not built around your DNA. (laughs) Where you were born. Your national identity. What you look like. That's not it anymore. There is a true Israel now that is called the church, built around the DNA of the blood of Jesus. That is the story. I read an article this week. I was about a 13-year-old boy in Texas who had been in the foster system for over a decade, and it was heart-wrenching. Uh, just what he said. He passed around from home to home. Literally, here, here's what he said, and I quote, I just want a family. I just want a parent. I just want brothers and sisters. Now, this is what Jesus has done for you and me. He has saved you out of isolation. He has saved you out of false, shallow forms of community. He has saved you out of an orphan state and adopted you into his family. Saving us into his family. And by the way, this community, what a picture, right? It's so good that it's not surprising that the world tries to emulate this kind of community everywhere we go. Does it not? Yeah, everyone is trying to fight for this deep sense of unity that overcomes differences like this. I mean, everything. Universities try to fight for this. Corporations try to create this in their work environment. Everywhere you go, gyms try to manufacture that, right? Your HOA, for crying out loud, is trying to create this type of camaraderie, right? Let's pull people together. Let's rally them around these things. But no social cause, no city, no gym, no anything else can create this. Because only this has Jesus as the cornerstone. The world wants Eden, and they want Acts 2, but you don't get Eden in Acts 2 without Jesus at the center. That is our common bond. That is our superseding unity, what binds us together. So that's the picture. I want to spend the rest of our time urging you to three things, because to get that picture is going to take three things. Number one, 
to experience this community, you must pursue Christ more than community. We don't pursue community, we pursue Jesus together, and community naturally follows. Okay, y'all tracking with that. In the order of the four things they devoted themselves to, first was apostles' teaching, then came fellowship, not the other way around. We don't pursue community, we pursue Jesus. And then we look around and we go, oh, you're pursuing Jesus too? Oh, you were rescued out of the pit of your own sin miraculously by the grace of Jesus too? Awesome. Let's do life together as we gaze, not at one another, but at Jesus. I think a lot of people look for community and they chase community and they want friends and they want this deep brotherhood and sisterhood so bad and they throw themselves into it. But the weight of what they're looking for is then put on people rather than Jesus. And so maybe if you're an extrovert, then you just fill up your schedule with tons of of hangouts and Bible studies and groups and you're at everything because you, you love it, but it doesn't quite fill you up enough. You need more of it. Now, if you're an introvert, it's a little different, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to try. And if you find some of it, then you kind of latch on with all you got, right? If you don't find it, then you kind of draw back in dejection and disappointment. And it creates a bit of a jaded feeling towards community. But community wasn't meant to bear the weight of community. Jesus was. He was not, we are not meant to bear the weight of all the needs you have for acceptance and purpose and hope and life and love. Jesus is. So if you just go looking for community, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You have to look for Jesus. So let me just ask, are you, are you chasing Jesus or are you just chasing Community. When we pursue Jesus, we get a stronger, deeper, more transcendent community that naturally follows. Is God's word the centerpiece to your friendships and and to our fellowship as a church? When you hang out, when you get together with people, do you you frequently not talk about the Lord? I would say that's not koinonia then. If he's not central to your relationship, then that's not koinonia. You might have some shared hobbies, You might enjoy the same type of humor, but you don't have koinonia. And you're going to hit a ceiling in the level of community that you can achieve. Okay, so we can't experience community without Christ. But number two, we can't enjoy community without commitment. So number two, to enjoy the fullness of this community, you must be committed to the community. If we want the fruits... We have to be devoted to the roots, right? The kind of picture we've described today is an all-in kind of picture. The word devoted, they devoted themselves. That is not a one-foot-in word. In the Greek, this word means to continue steadfastly, to persevere, to fully commit. Which makes sense, right? You don't drift into community. (laughs) You don't accidentally stumble into those four fruits that we described today. That doesn't accidentally happen. You devote yourself to it. It's uh, it's kind of like working out. Like, we want the benefits without the cost, right? Like, give me the three-minute abs. Anybody? I want the three-minute abs, right? If you just give myself three minutes a day, on the backside, I'll have a washboard 13-pack, right? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. You can't use odd numbers with abs. I don't know why I just said 13. (laughs) If I just give a little bit, then I get all the benefits. That is what we want. But community doesn't come microwaved in three minutes. There's no pill for community. (laughs) Right? It's not an optional fit in to your already jam-packed schedule. Let me kind of snap this piece in there a, a, a little bit. Let me say it this way. Convenient community does not exist. If you want convenience, then you won't find community. Y'all tracking with that? Convenient community does not exist. 
Do you see the kind of sacrifices they're making here? They're selling their possessions. They're giving things away. They're daily interacting. They're opening their own homes. They're making meals together. That's inconvenient. (laughs) Koinonia is inconvenient. Here's how Ray Ortland says it. He says it better than I could. When the early believers converted to Christ, it never occurred them occurred to them to fit him into the margins of their busy lives. No, no, no. They redefined themselves around a new immovable center. He was not an optional weekend activity along with the kids' soccer games. They put him and his church and his cause first in their hearts, first in their schedules, first in their budgets, first in their reputations, first in their very lives. They devoted themselves. Are you devoting yourself to community? Are you all in? Maybe you like the idea of community, but are you willing to devote yourself to it? Are you you devoting yourself to the Sunday gathering here at the well? Or is it kind of every once in a while or when something doesn't come up? Are you serving in the well and giving of yourself? Are you, are you a covenant member? Have you, have you made that commitment to step in and say, yes, this is my home, and I'm going to commit to this body? If not, why not? Are you in a gospel community? If not, why not? If you're in a gospel community, are you all in? Okay. If you're halfway in and you're existing at the fringes of a gospel community, you're one foot in and one foot out, I'm just going to tell you, you don't get the benefits. You don't get the benefits at all. In fact, you're going to be like, well, why would I put two feet in? I don't really, want, I'm, this isn't that great. Yeah, because you're not all in. And you go, well, Tyler, it's not convenient. Well, it won't be. We've talked about that, right? <laughs> I mean, even the two hours on a Tuesday night for us is not convenient, right? Imagine this kind of picture of koinonia. There's nothing convenient about sharing your life together like that. But gospel community has to be viewed not as an event, as, as a people. When I say, are you devoting yourselves to community? I don't mean the idea. I mean the person next to you. It has a face. Koinonia has faces right next to you. Are you devoting yourself to them? Well, Tyler, I'm too busy. Yeah, you, and you always will be, by the way, right? Like, that will not change. And I don't know if I need to read that Ray Orland quote again, but I will if I have to, right? Are you too busy? He's saying, hey, listen, it's not about busyness, it's about priorities. This gets rearranged around that, not vice versa. Well, Tyler, number three, I, I got my people already. <laughs> Like, I got my crew elsewhere, which, hey, if you have God-centered, Scripture-loving friends elsewhere that they're plugged into other local churches too, that's awesome. I praise God for that. We're not exclusive here at the well, but I will say it's kind of like that teenager who's home for one meal a week. <laughs> right? Meanwhile, they're hanging out with everyone else, and you're like, hey, you're a part of our family too. We like you. We want to see you. We want to do life with you. Too. And I think to some extent, what's being said when you're like, hey, I'm cool, I got my own friends, I don't need you, is what is really being said. And also, implicitly, you don't need me. And that's just not true. We do need each other. You go, maybe, Tyler, well, my devotion is to my blood family first, right? Well, hey, great. Honor your father and mother, love your brothers and sisters, love your kids, that is so good. But do not forget Jesus' strong words about redefining the family. Where he looks at his mother and brothers and says, hey, your mother and brother are here. And he goes, who's my mother and brothers? He looks at his disciples and says, they are. Anyone who does the will of my father, we have the same father, is my brother and sister. He's saying, hey, the priority of our spiritual family trumps even our blood family. Well, there's nobody like me in this gospel community. They're very different. They're all in different seasons of life, yeah? That may occur, right? And I don't know if when you join a gospel community, you're expecting everyone to be exactly like you, but that's not going to happen, right? That doesn't exist. In fact, I'm glad it doesn't because we're not after uniformity. We're after unity. That's different. Unity looks at all the diversity and differences and says there's something superseding that binds us together. 
It doesn't say we're trying to mimic and become robotic mirrors of each other. I get it. We, we gravitate naturally towards people like us. It's our human tendency. But I've seen over and over at the well, unexpected, deep relationships form when two people stick it out together who wouldn't necessarily normally be, be drawn together. But they go through hard things together. They're there for each other in difficult times. They begin to create memories and shared experiences. And the next thing you know, there's a bond that's unbreakable. Well, Tyler, I'm not getting much out of it. I've heard that before. I've I've tried community. I know what you're saying today. I've been there, done that, okay? I, I get it. How long have you tried it? Because what we're seeing described in these chapters isn't like a week long sprint. Okay, it's, it, this is a home-cooked meal, y'all. It takes time to bake. You don't wake up with these kind of relationships. You have to keep investing over and over. We devote ourselves over a long period of time. Well, Tyler, I've been hurt. The band comes up and we begin to respond. I want to address this last one because I, I get it, man. I, I get it. I've, I've been there. You know, do you know why I don't like painting? Like, well, you're just not a very cultured person, Tyler. You don't seem like the artistic, cosmopolitan type. Just stick to the cargo shorts and football, you know what I mean? (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm not offended by that. I do have high taste, okay? I can enjoy a good painting. The reason I don't like painting, do you know why? It's messy. Just gonna be honest, I don't like the mess. I like the finished product. I do not like the mess. Number three, to embody the unity of this community, you must embrace the messiness of this community. Community isn't clean, so expect hardship and hurt and be ready to press in despite it. We romanticize community and we romanticize Acts 2. Maybe you're going, well, the picture you've painted today from the Bible, Tyler, it's not my picture. That's not what I've experienced in church. And man, I've sat with you. I've been through membership conversations with you. My heart breaks over the things that you've experienced. The corruption in church, the hurtful words that have been said, the ignoring that you've experienced, the cliques that form the erroneous and and harmful teaching that you've been under, and all the things, on and on and on and on, right? If you've been in church long enough, you got wounds and scars to prove it. You know what, Lord and I are no exceptions. We know what betrayal and slander, rejection feels like. But Acts 2 through 6 was not clean either not sanitized. Like, think about it. In an instant, overnight, they go from 100 to 3,000 and 100. You think there's some logistical messes there? Yeah. How are we going to feed these people? Where are they? We're going to fit these people. We've got different language barriers to overcome. We've got people who can't even read. We've got high-class citizens with urban poor We've got Roman soldiers now in our midst with Jews. We've got homeless and we've got homeowners. We've got bosses and and we've got employees. We've got older people, younger people, widows, singles, married, and yes, kids. A lot of them, right? Whining, crying, noise-making toddlers. They didn't drop their kids off on the way into the temple. That wasn't happening, right? This community was messy. We see this picture and we erase the difficulty out of our mind. They didn't have to go through what we go through. Yes, they did. These are still sinners coming in proximity, rubbing against each other. People had their their feelings hurt and their preferences not chosen and they got offended. But you know what? They pressed into that. They didn't push back from the table and say, I'm out. They didn't run every time they got their feelings hurt. 
They didn't argue over carpet color or the noise of the band or things like these petty differences paled to the priority of Jesus and the community that was rallied around him. And that's what Jesus is inviting us into today, church. Yes, it's messy, but it's worth it. I'm going to end by just gazing again at the fire. Let's look at Jesus. You know, Jesus was all in for us, was he not? He looked at our mess, and he didn't distance himself. He didn't say, you know what, clean that up, and then I'll swoop down to rescue you. No, he left his home. He plunged into our brokenness. He met us while we were yet enemies. All of our baggage, all of our immaturity and weakness, and he stepped into that and he went all the way to the cross for it. He was all in for you and I, and he purchased us into his triune community. Now we get to be a part of his family. So let's thank God today, church, and be filled with the awe that he saved us into this family. And then let's do those three things. Let's pursue Jesus before we pursue community. Let's commit to community with an all-in devotion. And then let's embrace its mess with gospel care and grace. Let's pray together, church. King Jesus, we are in awe of you today. We're captivated by your goodness and your glory that you would rescue us out of sin and ourselves. And you, you've even saved us out of the privatized, individualized version of following you. And you've put us in a loving, caring, accepting, empowering, joy-filled family. Thank you, Jesus. What a gift that we're not alone. God, may the fact that this family is imperfect, would it encourage us today? Would it make us feel safe in our imperfections to be a part of this community? But Spirit of God, I ask right now that you would stir us to pursue you more than community and you would stir us to commit. I pray for those of us who are on the fringes, who are one foot in and one foot out, who are maybe having a, whole, having a hard time fully committing. Would you, would you do work in our hearts this morning? Would you address maybe the, the wounds and the, and the baggage and the, the sin or the, the holdups that are keeping us from that? And would you propel us by the power of your spirit to be all in? Mess and all. Thank you for your bride, Jesus. We're so grateful to be long to your people. And we pray through you, Jesus. Amen.